Nick Schantz, River Road. Jordan Hess, City Council Liaison, alternate, alternate perhaps? <laughs> Jeff Stevens, South 39th Street Neighborhood Council. Ray Aiden, Farview's Patty Canyon. Dennis Smooth, Grand Creek. Mark Foss, Southgate Triangle. Colleen Beal, Lewis and Clark. Sylvia with Missoula Neighborhoods. She's the new work study student. Jane, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Jane Kelly, neighborhood coordinator. Karen Gass, photo program assistant. Thank you very much. Do we have a quorum? We do. Excellent. Uh, next item on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda. Uh, do I hear a second? Damn it. Second, Nick Schantz. It has been moved and seconded that the agenda be adopted. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Good. We can move forward. Okay, next item, approval of the April 26, 2018 minutes. I presume everyone has read those minutes thoroughly and is ready to make a motion to adopt. Do I hear a motion? Janet Van Dyke, Moose Ken Gully. I move that we approve the minutes. Do I hear a second? Second. It has been moved and seconded that the April 26 minutes be adopted or approved. All in, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? The minutes are approved. Uh, next item is public comment on non-agenda items from the audience. Oh, I see we have a public. Uh, no. Obviously, there's no standards, Jeff. <laughs> no, uh, no, Mike Painter, no. I in, live in the Rose Park Neighborhood Council. I've been a Missoula resident since the early 1800s and a member of living in Rose Park <laughs> for the last 10 years or so. And I'm mostly here because I'm a Jordan Hess and Jane Kelly groupie. But I also thought as long as I was coming down, I would ask for your folks' assistance with a couple things. Um, one is I'm, I'm on the 9 advisory board, and they recently came up with what I think is a pretty good um, uh, Rubicon for when to call 911 and, of course, promoting uh, Smart 911, Emergency 911. So I'm going to hand out a page that includes that information that's available on their website. And then Rose Park also develops a neighborhood resource contact list. And I would ask for you that, to take a look at that. And if there's other numbers that you folks um, think would be helpful for your residents and members and ours, then that, that you uh, mark it up and then call Painter and say, Painter, change this, change that, do that. So, so I'm going to give these to Doug and ask him to pass them around. There's, there's 20, so there should be more than enough for everybody. So anyway, thank you for your service, and I appreciate your time. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, next item on agenda is presentations. And uh, the first item is bike sharing in Missoula. Jordan Hess, ASUM Office of Transportation Director, and Ben Weiss, Missoula Bike Ped Program Manager. And it looks like they brought bikes, and maybe we'll have a show and tell. I don't know. Thank you guys. Ben Weiss, Bicycle Pedestrian Program Manager for the city. Um, so bike sharing is a concept that uh, you may have seen um, an article or two in the newspapers recently about. Uh, the, the, the concept is pretty simple. It's bikes that are out and available for people to use. It's something that uh, has evolved over time and Free Cycles actually was one of the pioneers. Uh, in the 90s they developed a program, a bike library that they just left out and were able to maintain it for a few years, but then it became kind of cumbersome for them. Uh, in the intervening 20 years or so, technology has changed, and about five years ago, there was a big boom in big cities where uh, they'd invest in these big systems, these bike share systems that all checked into docks, and so you had to, you could pick them up anywhere at one of these docks, but you had to find another empty docking location to put them. Well, we looked into it at that time and decided that bike share wasn't for us. We have a lot of uh, transportation need not, uh, and no identified funding to invest in something like that at the city level. Uh, five years later now, there are new technologies that, uh, and so these bikes uh, represent a new wave of systems called dockless bike share. And so that means they don't need docks, they're just free floating and can be picked up and dropped off anywhere. 
Uh, they have locks built into the bike, and so that's how uh, you unlock it with your phone. It charges you uh, about a, I think it's a dollar a half hour, uh, and then different students and other population groups could get uh, discounted rates off that. Uh, when you're done, you just lock it and it ends your ride and it charges you and uh, it even provides non, um, non personally identifying data to the cities to help with um, potentially planning, you know, where, seeing where people are riding and um, where they're locking them and that sort of thing. Uh, and so we were approached by a couple companies uh, saying, hey, is Missoula at all interested in this? And uh, when they said that it's absolutely free to the city, we said, you know what, we might be. <laughs> and so um, we had uh, representatives from Spin Bike and Lime Bike come out and do demonstrations for us a couple months ago and uh, showed off the bikes, left a couple here with us, and it's been something that Jordan and I have been pondering. Uh, Jordan, in his role as ASUM transportation manager, uh, sees a, a potential real need to be able to provide uh, other mobility options for students at the university. And uh, it could also cater towards tourists, people working uh, who might need to drive into work but want to run errands or go out to lunch and don't want to get in their car or lose their parking spot. It's a great way to, uh, to meet that need. And uh, just to provide a, another way to get around town. Um, and so I'm going to let Jordan talk a little bit about uh, the university side of it and kind of where we're at in the, in the process. Great. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, so my day job is, is, uh, is at the uh, university as the director of the Office of Transportation, and so I'm kind of um, uh, speaking from that capacity right now. Um, as Ben said, we had a couple of these vendors approach us um, with interest in coming to Missoula. Um, from a university standpoint, um, we have several challenges. Um, we have um, uh, a large population of students who don't bring cars to campus. Um, they're required to live on campus their freshman year, and they need mobility options, particularly on Sundays when, um, when Mountain Line isn't running. Um, and we have a fleet of, of two, two different fleets of, of rental and checkout bikes on campus um, that are um, difficult to operate. Um, running a bike program is incredibly labor intensive. Um, there's always repairs. There's always tracking down bikes. Um, and um, so we, w we found it to be really attractive that we could have a, a fleet of rental bikes that was managed by a private company with some conditions um, that, we could, um, that we could regulate. Um, so as Ben said, um, uh, the, the, the city is interested in, in um, bringing um, a vendor to town. Um, the university has, exp has expressed um, some concerns with um, making sure that, that, you know, we don't want seven different dockless bike share vendors here. Um, we want one and we want them to do it well. Um, and so the university is going through a competitive process to select a vendor um, and, um, and then um, hopefully um, be able to move forward with one vendor um, sometime um, later this year. Um, and so um, that process is, is just beginning. Um, we'll, we'll be um, expecting proposals from these two vendors as well as um, possibly a few others um, in, the, uh, in the field. Um, and so really what I want to do is do a quick demo of how, the, of how the technology works and then maybe just reserve the rest of the time for questions and discussion um, and um, you know, identifying possible issues and, and so on. Um, so I'm going to stay by the microphone so that, so that the TV catches me, but, but normally what you would do is you would, um, you would pull up on your, on your phone app um, and, and see locations of available bikes. Um, so when I open this up and um, I see that there's a line bike near me um, and there's a couple of barcodes on the bike. And so in order to ride the bike, I just walk up to the bike and I, and I push ride and it gives me a little window where I can, where I can scan the barcode. I'm just going to enter the number because, like I said, so I can stay by the microphone here. Um, and so um, after you scan it, the, the lock pops open and it sings a little song to you. And then it's yours to ride and you, you ride it and you um, take it and when you're done riding, um, when you get to your destination, you park it in a safe legal place that's not blocking an egress and um, go in and run your errand or, or whatever you're doing. Um, and then um, the, uh, when you come back out from the grocery store or whatever, you, you can check out another bike and, and ride it to your next destination. Um, 
So it's really a point-to-point -point, uh, rental. Um, all of our bike rental options or bike checkout options on campus right now are, are um, you know, you can check out a bike at one location and return it to the same location. Um, so this adds a level of convenience where users can, um, can rent the bike and, and ride it across town and leave it there and then maybe take the bus home or, or take another option home. Um, so as Ben said, um, you know, there's no, there's no financial commitment on the, on the city's part or on the university's part. Um, and so really what we want to do is just make sure that we shape regulations that, um, that ensure a, a good quality operation here. Um, so maybe um, we'll stop there and, and take questions and, and have a discussion from there. Yeah, Jeff. Yes, uh, Jeff Stevens, South 39th Neighborhood Council. Looking at these bikes puts me in mind of a citrus farm. <laughs> but I do have a, a question. If, uh, if you decide to toss one of these in your van and go off to Spokane for the weekend, uh, do a little biking in Spokane, will they sound an alarm that they're being taken out of territory? Yeah, um, so I've been, I've been to a few neighborhood council meetings with, with the bikes, and um, if they're unlocked, um, I'll, I'll have them in the back of my vehicle, and, and they'll start making noises at me and telling me to unlock the bike, or, or you know, it's, so they, they make it pretty, um, they, they don't seem to be very punitive, they don't seem to, to tend to punish the, or fine the users for, for moving the bikes like that, but they do make it kind of annoying, so they'll make it, you know, they'll make it make a lot of noise until you put it back, or something like that. Yeah, do these have a GPS tracking yeah. system on them so you can actually know where they are? Yep. If someone tosses one in the river, it goes glub glub or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah. and I, I want to talk about, the, you mentioned the colors. The colors are designed to be colors that are highly visible so that they're, you know, obviously from a marketing standpoint, they want people to see the bike and identify them and use them. And just from a safety standpoint, you might have users that aren't routine bike, use, aren't routine bike riders and you want them to have um, that high visibility bike as well. Okay, any other questions? Yes. Nick Shaw's River Road. Um, I've, I've, had, I've tried the Lime Bike app before, but I've never um, played with the Spin Bike. Where, like, I know Lime Bike is Seattle, sort of, that's their sort of focus. Where is the Spin company have bikes now? I believe they're out of Sa uh, San Mateo, California, but they have bikes in maybe 40 cities and campuses nationwide. Cool. Lime is probably a little bit ahead of them. Uh, both companies, I think I can say this, uh, are venture capital funded, and so uh, I think Lime has been a little bit more successful raising money, and so has more rapidly deployed bikes, but uh, Spin seems to be focusing on their model, and they both seem to focus on customer service, and both companies would um, most likely come to town uh, and create a business here, and so hire four or five local people to manage the fleet, um, re rebalance the bikes, they call it. So if a whole bunch of them end up outside of the Wilma one night after a concert, the following morning, um, the crew would go out and disperse them around town so that they were more convenient for other people to use uh, that day, that morning. Cool. And um, I, are we going to get the electric versions of either of these? Do you know? Um, so we're writing our specifications for, our, we're doing a, a request for information um, at the university, and we're writing our specifications so that they can outline all of their products, um, and we can decide yes or no on them. Um, Line Bike, for instance, offers a single speed, a three speed, and an eight speed bike, pedal bike, and then they offer an electric assist bike. Um, also, you may have seen news about about scooters. Um, they both, both companies offer electric scooters. Hmm. Um, I don't know what, what need that fills here, so I think we would be much more cautious about permitting those. Um, but, um, you know, there's, there's a variety of options, and I think we'd kind of assess it moving forward. Hey, Jordan, Ray Aiden. Um, from your experience with the bike program you've had on campus, do you see these as functioning in a similar way, and do they tend to be used just within city limits, or? Do you think there might be a mass exodus to the airport at the end of a semester? Or we um, we operate two bike programs, so we have a we have a semester long rental program, and that's really geared towards students who come in and need a bike for you know a fixed period of time. Um, and that I don't I don't anticipate that program changing at all. Um, that program's been highly successful, and we have pretty much 100% utilization and waiting lists for the bikes. We have 71 of those bikes right now, I think. Um, the other bike program is the Yellow U-Bike program, which is a program where the, 
the students can go and check out a bike for 72 hours from the Mansfield Library. Um, we used to operate that program ourselves, um, but the Mansfield Library, um, it turns out, is very good at checking things in and out. Um, and they're very good at um, assessing a fine if someone doesn't return the item. And they have a really much wider span of hours. Um, that's the program that I'm not quite sure. I mean, that, that's the program that I could see impacted by this um, is, you know, because it's really, you have to go into the library and present your ID and, and then go and get the bike and then you have to return the bike to the library. So I could see the convenience of this. Um, you know, in the short term, we'll, we'll continue to offer that program, but I could see the convenience of these programs kind of rendering that yellow bike program kind of obsolete. And to the airport question, we do periodically pick up yellow bikes from the airport. Um, <laughs> and um, um, it just goes with the territory. Yeah. And then one more, if I can. Which had to do with how tamper proof are they? I mean, I could see somebody knocking some part of it off and. You know. Yeah. So um, I want to go back to your other question about riding them out of the community. We asked the vendors that specific thing, especially with the Bitterroot Trail now that goes all the way down to Hamilton. And they said that they can see where bikes are going on their GPS. And if it's uh, a problem, meaning that if um, by someone riding the bike down to Lolo every night, if that is preventing someone else who wants to ride a bike from riding one, then they might stop it. But if that is making it easier for that person in Lolo to get around, then they have no problem with the bikes going in and out of the community. Um, and then as for tamper proof, uh, both bikes have designed their, both companies have designed their bikes to, with very odd sizes so that none of the parts are usable on other people's bikes. Um, things like the seat post and the way that the seat attaches, it can't, it's not replicated on any other commercial bike. Um, the size of the grips don't fit on other handlebars, that sort of thing. Um, and then the seat post can't come out anyway. The tires are foam, they're not, uh, they're not tubes, so they don't get flats. Um, but then also maintaining the bikes is part of what the, uh, the local staff for the company would do. And so um, part of what we would probably in the agreement that we'd enter into with them would be um, language about how frequently the bikes are maintained and also about language about what percentage of them would be available at any given time of day or time of the year. Do you foresee any problems about people leaving the bikes in inappropriate places and like in the middle of the sidewalk or, you know, and blocking things? Yes, we do. And um, it's, uh, it has been an issue in other places. There have even been some kind of high profile uh, media stories. What um, I've heard from friends and family that live in cities with these is that the first two weeks to a month is... Uh, it's pretty obnoxious, and then people get better about it. Um, the other thing is that at least Spin and maybe Lime Bike 2 have a feature that when you go to unlock the bike, before it lets you ride, it makes you answer a question of if the bike was locked properly the last time. And so they don't use that information to find the previous rider, but it creates that sense of, um, oh, shoot, someone's going to know that I locked this uh, inappropriately or, or not. Um, so I'm going to make a point to to line it up. And for as many stories as we've heard about bikes being stacked, we heard one that uh, some guy's 40th birthday, his friends thought it would be fun to stack 40 lime bikes in his front yard. Um, we've heard those stories. We also hear stories, and I've seen video of random people walking down the street and just like adjusting the bikes to fit better on the sidewalk so that they're out of people's way and um, that it, there's a culture that emerges around using them and keeping them look nice. And I want to add, I, was, I went to Seattle last week as part of a, a fact-finding uh, process um, to, you know, to evaluate the, the, the bikes. And um, I really didn't see much bad behavior. I mean, there was a little bit here and there, um, but I think it's kind of um, you know, the exception. But um, both bikes have, um, and one of our standards will be that they have to have a 24-hour phone number, um, so that, and it has to be printed on the bike. So if, if you're... You know, if you live in the university district and a bike ends up in your front yard, you have a phone number that you can call and someone will come and get it. Um, and then we'll try to do some user training. Um, I see our role as, um, you know, creating some regulations and creating some education with the users. Um, and I see the company's role as being responding to those problems. 
Um, you know, and I guarantee one of these bikes, if, if, if we do end up having these here, one of them will end up in the river. And so how quickly does it get out of the river? Is, you know, that's, that's my concern, is that um, you know, there's going to be some degree of bad behavior, but, but how quickly do they respond to that, that bad behavior and make it, make it right? Julie Devlin, Rose Park. So do you foresee ha having to hire staff, or do, does that company send staff here to take care of picking yeah. all the bikes up at the Wilma the morning after? Yeah, so they, they come here. Um, their revenue model is based on volume of checkout. So they, they just try to make the bikes as easy to use as possible. And they, they're, what they're finding in their other communities is that their their day-to-day -day operations um, will support the staff that it requires to um, to manage the system. So they would come in and they would hire they would hire people here. Um, we wouldn't be hiring anyone, um, and we wouldn't be expending any funds. It's just us permitting the company to be here essentially, and they set it up and operate it as a private business with no um, with no need for us to hire staff um, and um, no need for us to do the day-to-day -day management. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Any other questions? Seeing none, you have folks have anything else to add? I guess I just kind of like um, general um, opinions. If, if um, you know, I'd love to know how the community forum feels about this this initiative, and, and if this is something okay, that people, people speak would be up. About. Do, you, do you like this idea? I'm a fan. Um, we went to Seattle maybe a month ago, and <clears throat> when we were in Seattle. We just like found line bikes and hopped on them and like rode around um, the western the, the one of the college campuses over there. And it was really fun. It was a cool opportunity. Um, so I, I mean, I really like them. I think that people did seem to treat them pretty well. Of course, there was some that were kind of in awkward places, but I don't know. It seemed it seemed cool, and, and we really enjoyed it when we were there. I think it's a great idea too. I just think it might be work intensive for a while in the beginning. Any other comments? S seeing none, I'd like to thank you for coming in a very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. <clears throat> yes. Uh, for the record, I'd like to notice that uh, Ed Nolder with Riverfront and Anthony Joe with Captain John Mullen are here. Yes, I noticed them come in. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, next item on the agenda is the annual Title 20 update. Jen Gress from Zula Planner 2. Thank you. That update included a process for regular review to address issues that may be difficult to understand, need clarification, or need updating because of changing conditions. So the process so far has included a presentation of summary update list to the Land Use and Planning Committee on January 3rd. Comments have been solicited in different ways, including sending the information to the Office of Neighborhoods for distribution. Planning Board held a public hearing on April 3rd, and it continued until April 17th. The Land Use and Planning Committee discussed the proposed amendments over four meetings, and the updates were scheduled for a City Council public hearing on June 4th. So because we have limited time tonight, I'll be providing an overview of the amendments and touching on key topics, and then I encourage you all to look at the amendments and project background on the City's website, and then I'll provide that address at the end of this presentation. You'll be hearing again about the general topics of change and the general direction those changes are proposed to go. The proposed um, list of potential changes address 11 different topics 
and includes 70 proposed amendments. And overall, the amendments are intended to clarify, streamline, and modify existing regulations. This year's proposed amendments generally clarify regulations by making sections easier to read. Other proposed amendments will clarify what sections of the code apply for specific development options, such as townhome exemption developments, and include updated and new definitions in the terminology chapter. Duplicate language is being proposed to be removed. Parking for accessory dwelling units is addressed. Cross-references will be corrected, and the already approved Rattlesnake Gardens Neighborhood Character Overlay District is being integrated into the code. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Other proposed amendments generally streamline procedures by removing the conditional use process for accessory dwelling units, removing the protest period uh, provision for those bed and breakfast uses required to go through the conditional use process, provide for a more expedient route for board approved projects to be extended time wise, and simplify the notification process for tourist home uses. Modification of regulations include providing additional guidance for some townhome exemption developments, requiring accessory dwelling units to have an address on the property so emergency personnel can find them, introducing cideries into Title 20, and then staggering the term of expirations for members of the Board of Adjustment. So as you can see from the previous list, there's a large number of amendments. Um, proposed for this year's update, so I'd like to narrow that list a little bit and draw your attention to areas uh, that we feel are the mostly policy-based proposals. And those amendments are the areas of townhome exemption developments, tourist homes, accessory dwelling units, buildings as a sign, cideries, bed and breakfast uses, and then procedures uh, for lapse of approvals. Since 2011, townhome exemption developments, also known as TEDs, have been allowed as an exemption to subdivision regulations as long as the proposal is in conformance with the applicable local zoning. In 2016, the city added development standards to help uh, guide TED projects of a certain size related to the zoning district and the surrounding areas. Since the 2016 development standards have been in place, there's been, still been some confusion over which additional zoning regulations are triggered. In particular, whether we apply multi-dwelling, townhouse, bike parking, and landscaping standards, and how to reference the land associated with the individual unit. In addition, many of the TED current, current TED projects that have been reviewed include building types that are two-unit attached that look like two-unit townhouses, but haven't been required to comply with the existing townhouse design standards. There are several proposed amendments for TEDs, but in general, there's been confusion on the distinction between the terms town home, which is the type of ownership unit that is created through a town home exemption development, and town house, which is a specific building type that's already addressed in Title 20. Additionally, there's been confusion regarding whether some multi-dwelling standards should apply to these developments. We're proposing amendments that would clarify this distinction and would direct certain TED developments to the existing townhouse standards when applicable. And then that provides for a more desirable and predictable project. Another proposed amendment is to add an option for cash in lieu for required parkland, and that'll include guiding criteria to ensure that the best use of the land is taken care of, and potentially encouraging affordable housing in that same process. The last set of proposed amendments applying to TEDs will cross-reference the townhouse standards to the townhome exemption developments and will clarify which landscaping requirements apply to which kinds of TED projects. New terminology will be included to help define the land area owned by each townhouse. Defining this area of land as a parcel creates inconsistencies in the application of the zoning regulations so in order to be clear, staff is suggesting defining these land areas as TED ownership units. <clears throat> in January of 2017, an application for a tourist home located in the Central Business District was reviewed by staff, and the question of whether notification of the surrounding area was, was required was raised. So the discussion clarified council's intent that tourist home developments in non-residential districts do not need to notify surrounding neighborhoods. 
A second amendment will modify the notification area required in residential districts to only include closest parcels to a proposed tourist home, making the notification area consistent with the newly proposed accessory dwelling unit notification area, which is coming in a minute. Currently, when notification is required for a tourist home, it's the responsibility of the applicant to produce the notification list. In most other situations, staff is responsible for doing the notification. And since state law uh, dictates that the city may not provide distribution lists that include property ownership information to the public, and the tools that are used by staff to generate distribution lists are not readily available to the public, the requirement that people applying for tourist home licenses must generate a notification list on their own has been a source of confusion and caused unnecessary wait times in the process. So what we're proposing is a notification area of one parcel deep surrounding that parcel that proposed tourist home is on. And this is in keeping with the suggested notification process discussed by LUP in early summer regarding uh, tourist homes. So if you, if you look here, this would be the proposed tourist home and then notification would happen in each of these parcels. And these are just some examples to kind of help guide people um, what we're saying one parcel deep. Proposed amendments regarding accessory dwelling units include removing the conditional use process and allowing them to be permitted by right in all zoning districts, but still maintaining a notification process for those parcels closest to the proposed ADU. Over the past five years, there's been uh, 17 conditional use ADUs, and the city's approved all of them with, um, without any substantial conditions. So making this change will simplify the process and represent a major efficiency for land use planners and applicants while still keeping surrounding neighbors informed. Notification would be for detached and internal addition ADUs in certain zones wherever conditional use was required. Other existing regulations for accessory dwelling units will be maintained, um, and those include that the project must comply with all applicable portions of Title 20, the applicant must reside on the site, and an ADU permit must be obtained and renewed yearly. So those are not going away. A second amendment will clarify the parking space required when developing an ADU be can, can be used by anyone on site, not just this, uh, the accessory dwelling unit itself. And then the last proposed amendment regarding ADUs will require the unit be posted with a street address according to the city fire code. And then again, as discussed earlier regarding the notification of the tourist home, the notification process for the detached or internal additional ADU in certain zones will be similar by contacting adjacent property owners, again, one parcel deep. So the next topic is building as a sign. And first I'd like to explain why we're addressing this and what we mean by it. So while working on the Missoula Design Excellence Project, concerns were raised over the potential for buildings to be designed as signs. Essentially, a building is a sign when the architecture of the building becomes that sign. For example, at this top one here, if you remove the logo and the text of the sign at the top of this building, you're still gonna know that it's a Verizon building so the building is the sign. And if you look at the bottom uh, picture, um, if you remove the logo and signage again here, you're not gonna know that that's a Verizon building. It could be any building. Therefore, the building is not the sign. So over the past few years, several developments have brought to staff's attention the need to develop standards that prevent these so-called buildings as signs. With assistance from Winter and Company, um, which is the consultant for the Arch um, Architectural Design Excellence Project, staff proposes several amendments within the site ordinance chapter to clarify what constitutes a building as a sign and to strengthen the language that would limit such types of signage on commercial structures. Amendments involve expanding the list of prohibited signs, defining and clarifying the extent of buildings as a sign, modifying the language in the sign measurement section to capture background color, and then includes the threshold for the use of corporate colors. And staff's been mindful that it is important that any changes don't limit desired flexibility and leave room for artistic expression. Development Services has received several inquiries regarding regulations to develop cideries and would like to have them referenced in Title 20 for consistent application of regulations. 
Proposed amendments would create a new use designation for cidery, which would be in line with the state definition, and propose to designate the cidery as permitted and or conditional the same way a winery is proposed right now. Additionally, wineries are proposed to be changed from conditional to permitted in the central business district to treat cidery and winery uses consistently and similar to microbrewery, distillery, and tavern uses. Staff recommends an amendment to require design standards for new bed and breakfasts in the M1, M1R zoning district, which is consistent with what's required in business and commercial districts, and to remove the protest provision that is spe specific to bed and breakfast uses in the conditional use procedure. The protest provision has never been called upon, and this would streamline that process slightly. The lapse of approval section for conditional use, design review, and variances each require several steps to have been met within two years or the approval that they received is void. There can be many reasons a permit is not being issued in a timely manner, and it's um, onerous to expect a project to be final within two years. However, if someone is serious about their project, they'll have at least applied for and received a building permit or a, condition, or a zoning compliance permit within that two years. The change is to simplify the requirements to just a building or zoning compliance permit. Additionally, in situations where an applicant was seeking an extension of one year for the approved project, it was required to circulate that extension back to the same approving body, all with the same information and the same process again, just for the one year extension. So there's an amendment proposed to shift the consideration to the zoning officer in order to simplify that process. We've been seeing a trend towards small home developments and believe that the smaller home would generate less vehicular need. So similar to the parking requirements for an ADU, proposed amendment will create another residential parking category for detached houses and townhouses of less than 600 square feet. And then that amendment will require a minimum of one parking space per dwelling unit. So the last topic for the evening is a miscellaneous category which contains 10 non-related items. Five of those 10 amendments are represented here and create consistency in character, excuse me, create consistency in terms in the residential district, codify the existing Rattlesnake Gardens neighborhood character overlay zone. They rework the parcel and building standards in the residential districts chapter for more clarity, stagger the expiration date of the Board of Adjustment members, and update the description of communication service establishment in the communication use classification section. So the next steps for adoption of this year's Title 20 amendments will be to hold a City Council public hearing to adopt final changes on June 4th. Background information for this package of updates amendments as well as planning board and committee discussion and minutes can be found on the City's website by clicking on the upcoming hearings and votes, which is located in the lower right hand <coughs> corner of the main webpage, and then clicking on the history link for the Title 20 project. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Uh, how soon do you expect that these amendments will finally be adopted by the City Council? Um, June 4th is the public hearing for the City Council, which is the, the last step. So if they adopt it without sending it back to committee, which I don't see um, why they would send it back to committee at this point, they should go into effect 30 days later. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? <coughs> Can we just go back to the bed and breakfast part for a minute? I just. Could you tell us a little bit, you know, deeper about what changes are being made relative to what was in there to start with? The biggest change for bed and breakfast is that there are some that are required to go through conditional use depending on what zoning district it's located in. This is the bed and breakfast use is the only conditional use process that has a protest in it. Um, and we haven't had a protest ever since bed and breakfast have been um, in, the, in the zoning code. So what it's doing is just removing that protest period. It's not allow, It's not removing the conditional use. It still goes through that process. People still have con comments on it. Um, it just removes the protest. Hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Any other questions? Yes. Um, can you clarify, like, why would they not um, want buildings to allow, like, uh, architecture that looks like a sign? Um, I would think the um, opposition to that was that it takes up, like, less ground space for a sign elsewhere and um, gives it, like, um, the neighborhood it's in more character. So why, why did they come up with that decision? It's part of, it's, we're working off some of the um, information we receive by going through the growth policy where people want to maintain a certain look in Missoula and yet still keep its eclecticness of it. If you start to allow um, the buildings that are signs, then y you kind of allow it to become everywhere USA because you're going to find the same signs in the same buildings in every, in every situation. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? Do you have any other comments you'd like to make? Pardon me? Do you have any other comments you'd like to make? I do not. <laughs> Jane. Do you expect an uptick in ADUs when, by, taking the, by ma making it by right? We do have a couple of projects that have been waiting in the wings, um, but I don't expect we're going to have a land rush of it. But I, it, part of it is to, yes, go ahead and have more of them. So. Okay, seeing no other questions, <clears throat> thank you very much uh, for your presentation. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda, a reallocated fund request from Farview's Paddy Canyon in the alarmingly small amount of $33.41. <coughs> it is uh, <coughs> obvious that these folks have not mastered the art of feeding fulsomely at the public trough. Uh, but uh, explain yourself, sir. <laughs> you serious? OK. Great, and Farby's Paddy Canyon, we did a good job of uh, budgeting what we needed to spend, and everything was going really well until I walked into the mailing department, the, and they said, oh, there's no zip codes on your postcards. And so they didn't get printed in the place that was supposed to have printed them. So we went over budget. And so I needed to ask for some money to cover that. Sorry. <laughs> okay, this, uh, yes. This is Doug Grimm. I move that we uh, uh, rent uh, $33.41 to uh, cover the, uh, the cost to, for their mailing. Okay, do I hear a second to that motion? I will second that motion and uh, 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 all in favor of approving this enormous expenditure, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? The motion is passed. Excuse me, Jeff. Can we go back to number eight? To number eight. Oh, you have more neighborhood project funds? Oh, uh, okay. Okay, what I wanted to say tonight is Doug Christman, Dave Christman, I'm sorry, um, has, um, his term has expired, so he decided not to run again. He's served for many, many years and has done a great job. So that leaves a spot opened on our Neighborhood Project Funds Committee. And I was wondering tonight if there's anybody who would like to fill that spot. There we have, there's four, four people from Community Forum by resolution is on the committee. Uh, Ray Ayton, Will McLaughlin, Jeff Stevens, and one person um, is 
community um, city council, and that's Julie Armstrong. So we're short one person from community forum. I was wondering if anybody would like to uh, join that committee. They meet as needed for the small grants and just one time in the fall for the large grants. So is there anybody interested in serving? Colleen B. O. Lewis and Clark, yes, I would. That's great, Colleen. Thank you. Um, Colleen, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and why you'd like to serve? In my, before I retired, I did a lot of, um, I worked for a small nonprofit here in town and did a lot of small and large um, grants um, for various um, different things that we needed. Um, and um, I just kind of like that part of it, part of things, so. Great, thank you very much. You're on the committee. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay, next item on the agenda is special events. Do we have any special events? Any not so special events? Well, the special events that are coming up, we have um uh we have um Sunday Streets is coming up in September on I went to October just a second. We have Sunday Streets on September the 9th. And uh, it runs from 12 to 4 tentatively. And then right after that, Rose Park is having their general meeting. So we'll be busy that day. And then Stories and Stones. This is great news. It's not on the same day this year. Stories and Stones is going to be September the 16th at the cemetery. If you haven't been, it's a great, great time uh, to go and see the historical interpreters and uh, see, learn about some of the history of uh, Missoula. There's usually around. I think 800 people. There's a guy with a clicker who counts them, and there's usually around 800 people. And we give away a lot of cookies and collect a lot of email addresses and, and teach the citizens also about neighborhood councils. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, staff report. Okay, I'll go first. Um, I introduced everybody to Sylvia Borstead. We're very happy to have her in the Office of Neighborhoods, and uh, we hope she'll stay with us for a long time. And um, she's a political science major at, at the university. And uh, do you want to add anything? I'm also a student senator. Um, I think I'm going to be talking Jane's head off with politicalness this year. <laughs> Thanks, Sylvia. Okay, um, the, the uh, United Way is having a day of action, and that's on June the 22nd. And last year was the first year, and this will be the second year, that they have asked neighborhood councils if they need any projects in their neighborhoods done. If anybody has any projects that they can think of, please make sure to contact me one way or another. Um, so far, we're looking at Rose Park um, cleanup and also the Slant Street Gateway Park cleanup and uh, weed pull, and uh, the Neighborhood Council will do that in conjunction with the National Wildlife Federation and the United Way. So if anybody has any ideas for your neighborhood for a cleanup or something like that where you could use a bunch of volunteers, just let me know. Um, the bylaws were on the City Council agenda. Unfortunately, the link was not there to the bylaws, but they will be on the consent agenda for June the 4th. That's the community forum bylaws that were approved. So they have not been approved yet, but they will be soon. Um, also, um, we, there's going to be a neighborhood watch meeting, and Karen made a really nice brochure to hand out. And oh, uh, Marshall already has one. Thank you, Karen. And so anyway, it's going to be on June the 12th. That happens to be my birthday. But anyway, um, if you were thinking about maybe if people would like to put out sandwich boards to advertise this closer to the date, maybe we could do something like that. Um, contact me, and maybe we could talk about that. And that concludes my report. Any questions? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. OK. Day of action, June 22nd. Bylaws will be approved on June the 4th. 
The Neighborhood Watch meeting is on June the 12th, 5.30 to 7, right here in City Council Chambers. What does it say? 5.30 to, 5 to 6.30. Oh, okay. Well, that, yeah, we just needed an end time, so it, it, it's, a, it's a little flexible. <laughs> okay, anything else? Do you get all your dates? Okay, thank you. Karen, do you have... Yeah, I just wanted to talk about our bus tour that we had in April, April 19th. I have a few slides to show you. Um, we owe uh, Mike Painter a big thank you. It isn't on? We owe Mike Painter a big thank you. Um, he was very gracious and mapped out the whole route and planned it all out for us. We could not do this event without his help. Um, we visited the heart of Missoula, Lower Rattlesnake, Northside, Riverfront, Rose Park, University District, Upper Rattlesnake, and the West Side this year. And here's a few photos. Notice Heather Harp. A few of our presenters, Mike Thane and, a, and from Spectrum. Marisa is with the Heart of Missoula leadership team. We had both um, Gwen Jones and Brian Von Losberg and Heidi uh, West join us as well. And then the following Sunday, we um, tabled at the Earth Day and got a bunch of new people interested in receiving our um, weekly digest and got our word out about the neighborhood councils. Doug Grimm helped out there. You see Jane and her husband. Uh, Marisa helped us again there. And Kathy Nolan also was a, one of the volunteers who came to help us as well. We just want to thank everyone for helping us with those events. And I also actually wanted to mention too, um, Sylvia has been helping me um, get our Facebook page up and going. Um, it is published. Um, we're kind of testing it to make sure that we have it all set up to the best that we can. So um, if you see us on Facebook, that's a new page that Sylvia has helped with. So is it under, how would you find it? City of Missoula Office of Neighborhoods. Okay, thank you very much, Karen. The next item on the agenda is Neighborhood Council Reports. And I would ask you to try to limit your uh, reports to three minutes or less. And we'll start at this end of the table. Colleen Beal, um, Lewis and Clark neighborhood. We um, uh, know that one of our signs is almost made um, from the park and rec, so thank you again for voting in our little grant. Um, we'll have uh, the Bank of Pawn signs up probably by late July. Um, also, um, our steering committee, um, the Bancroft Pond Steering Committee, is um, uh, had a Lewis and Clark Cub Scout troop come to get earn their civic duty badge to come and help clean up our park, and um, we're asking the neighborhood to also help clean up the park. Um, just one little sideline. I happened to be home from our vacation, and Washington School was holding the, for three days. They have had stuff in our park. Uh, to um, enhance the education aspect that we're hoping will develop more. So that's it for us. Uh, Mark Foss, Southgate Triangle. Uh, we got nine trees planted in Bellevue Park, which is a great thing for us. And uh, mainly we're just focusing on the park right now, trying to get it developed with the uh, bike park feature. So that's what we're doing. 
Uh, Dennis Smooth with Grand Creek. We had our spring meeting, neighborhood council meeting on May 15th, and we had a couple different speakers. We had Andy Myers from the Snowball. He explained the expansion and how it affects our traffic and road. And then we had a gentleman from the Mountain Line, which we're trying to get the service up there talking about it. And it kind of works together with the, with the Snowball, getting people up and since they're expanding. And then we had Kevin Davis from the Reserve Street Citizens Group. This is a new group that he's starting. I guess I think most of you folks know Reserve Street is kind of a problem right now. <coughs> And uh, he's trying to get the citizens involved, working with the highway department. Or yeah, uh, and then also we talked about the snow plowing on the Grand Creek Trail. Uh, we had to have the Grand Creek Trails do it, and we're trying to work out something else. It was a real good meeting, and we we had quite a few folks out, and that's all. Anthony Joe, Captain John Mullen. We had our leadership team meeting last week on Tuesday. Uh, we had Shane Stack from Ms. Uh, Montana Department of Transportation talk about the Russell Street project. Um, we also talked about the uh, Chuck Wagon Road status update and uh, an update on the 44 Ranch Playground and the fundraising efforts on that. So. And we also tentatively set a date for our next general meeting, which will be on August 28th. Thank you. Ray Aiden, Farbius Petty Canyon. Uh, last leadership team meeting and the one that'll be in June is uh, a basically planning meeting for having a general meeting that will be in July. And the intention is to have it in what we hope will be our new park, which is Ninkapata Park. Um, and so it'll be an outdoor barbecue, probably. Uh, this is the plan, but we're still in process. Uh, Jeff Stevens, South 39th Street Neighborhood Council. We've had one very interesting development in our neighborhood. As you might be aware, a few years ago, a townhome, a pretty large townhome project was approved in our neighborhood uh, uh, off of uh, Hillview Way. And at that time, there was very little provision for public input or city council review. And, uh, and of course, we were pretty upset uh, that we worked afforded that opportunity because of the regulations at that time. Well, uh, since then, uh, the developers have allowed their initial permit to expire. So they've got to reapply, and they'll be reapplying under the new provisions, which is very good news for us. And we intend to take full advantage of, of those provisions. And uh, the developers have scheduled a meeting in Wapakia Park uh, next Tuesday at, uh, I believe, at 6 o'clock. And uh, so anyone that's interested, I encourage you to attend. Thank you. Nick Shons River Road. Um, we have had some recent wins in our neighborhood. We got a, a street light put in. Um, we didn't, we just asked for it and, and the city was kind enough to do it. Um, in a sort of a dark sort of intersection, which is nice. And um, it sounds like we're gonna, we have a sort of pseudo sidewalk in our neighborhood that's hard to see and they're, they're gonna paint the edge of that. So with Jane's help, those things happen and we really appreciate that. Um, we have been sort of lamenting the Russell Street project, which affects our neighborhood. We appreciate all the communication, but it still makes getting to and from everywhere a struggle. Um, we've been working on our bylaws the last couple of uh, meetings. Uh, we had an Invest Health walkabout again recently. Um, our next meeting is June 20th at 6.30, Garden City Harvest. Ed Nolder, Riverfront. Uh, we had a general meeting at River Park Pavilion, or Silver Park Pavilion, which is right by the Osprey Stadium on Tuesday. Uh, we had a presentation on the uh, Old Sawmill District from Ed Weatherby. Uh, we also had Jeans also from uh, Garden City Harvest. She's the executive director, just talking about the different gardens and community gardens around town. Uh, we had Dennis Bauman from 
Missoula Water come and talk about the changes that they've made with the water system. Uh, we also had Big Sky Public Relations uh, come and talk about the Russell Street project and the uh, advancements in that and the planning. Uh, we also uh, worked on or talked about our bylaws and did uh, amended those and voted on those. Uh, we also had um, Heather Hart, which is a city council member for Ward 3. She came and gave us an update on our neighborhood. And we had uh, leadership team elections as well. We voted in another person on the leadership team. And that's all, thank you. <clears throat> Julie Devlin, Rose Park. We had our meeting yesterday afternoon uh, over at the Senior Center, that's our new meeting place. And um, Jane already told you that one of the main things is that we set our, uh, our work day because we got new volunteers from United Way. So we're gonna use them to work at the Slant Street it's called Slant Street Gateway. <laughs> um, it's across from RFD2 on Mount Avenue. It's, it's a park that's very neglected. So we're gonna need all the help we can get. So that's gonna be June 22nd, clean up. Um, the next thing we talked about, the traffic circle at West Crosby in Cleveland, uh, which is right in front of my house. <laughs> and um, the, I've contacted Ben Weiss, and the next step is he says that he has to get the engineer and the uh, city clerk to tell us what the next step is, to tell us how to proceed. But I went to every one of the neighbors in the project area, which was 31 neighbors, and, and they were all enthusiastic. I, I had one negative, and they were all positive, but they can't all come up with the money. It's it's a lot of money to come up with. So we're gonna have to figure out what to do about that. Um, that's about, oh, we plan for a general meeting. It's gonna be, as Jane said, September 9th over at Rose Park, and we're gonna have the ice cream, the Big Dipper there. And we have elections then. And I guess that's it. Thank you. Well, it's one that I applied for the grant two years ago, and you guys approved it and, and gave money, but it's just not moving ahead. No reason, really, but uh, but it's move. I hope it's moving ahead now. Everyone's aware of it, and everyone's in favor of it, but it's just the money. I mean, we have to pay for it, so. No, it's the old one. Yeah, I think you were there to see the site a couple summers ago, right? Weren't you on the committee? Yeah, I, <coughs> I remember reviewing that, yeah. Marshall O'Dell, Miller Creek. We haven't had a meeting recently, but we have been checking on the new Jeanette Rankin School, and it has seemed to be progressing quite well. And I want to encourage everybody on this neighborhood watch to be at the meeting Tuesday night, June 12th, 2018, at 5.30 to 6.30 or 7 at City Council Chambers. It's, uh, we've been trying to get hold of the neighbors, encourage them, and I encourage you to all do the same. Thank you. Janet Van Dyke, Moose Ken Gully. As Jeff has already shared, we will be having a meeting with the developers of Hillview Crossing uh, next Tuesday. And Moose Ken Gully and South 39th Street will be having a joint general meeting, a barbecue on June 27th at um, Southside Park, I believe. I, I, yeah, Southside Park. Southside? Playfair Park. Playfair. Play fair, play for. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Doug Grimm, Upper Rattlesnake. Um, we're planning a, a meeting uh, this fall. Uh, 
since so many people in Missoula like to uh, go up the upper rattlesnake and hiking and so on, about three days ago, I walked <clears throat> out of my car and passed a bush in my house, going to my front door, and I just lightly brushed against a bush and sat down at my kitchen table to look at my mail and noticed a tick had evidently uh, crawled off my arm and was walking across my kitchen table. So uh, just be aware that it is tick season in the rattlesnake, and uh, it probably will be that way until uh, the end of June or early July. And be also careful if you hear people wanting to take an inner tube and float Rattlesnake Creek. Uh, I would not allow anyone to do that until after the 1st of July. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. <clears throat> I'd like to thank everyone for being so succinct in their presentations. Looks like we're on schedule to get out of here substantially early, but not before our esteemed representative from the Missoula City Council, Jordan Hess, makes his presentation on city council so, activities. So I have 54 minutes? You have 54? <laughs> yes, but if you want to be, if you want to retain your popularity and your electability, uh, Please make it somewhat I will, than yeah. That. No, actually, there's not a ton to report in the last month. Um, there's been um, some interesting things. Um, we awarded a couple of public works contracts for um, some sidewalk projects, including the Van Buren Phase Three project and the Invest Health project on the, um, the west side and the, um, and the uh, Franklin to the Fort neighborhood. Um, and so I believe um, the Van Buren project is, is, has started, and I'm not sure about the um, Invest Health project, but I, I think that um, if it hasn't started, it will start soon. Um, we had an update yesterday at the Public Works Committee on the pedestrian plan um, update, or the pedestrian uh, master, master plan that um, Aaron Wilson in the Transportation Division is putting together. Um, They've assembled some really interesting data on um, what areas, and, and I know a lot of you were involved in collecting data on uh, sidewalk conditions. Um, so they've taken that data and, um, and uh, overlaid you know, sidewalk conditions and where sidewalks are missing um, with some socio-demographic data, um, like rates of obesity or rates of poverty or rates of households that don't own cars. Um, and a few other types of metrics. And they're trying to figure out a blended approach for how to prioritize um, what sidewalks to, to put in where they're missing. Um, they also looked at um, residential density and employment density um, and are trying to kind of come up with a, a, an algorithm or a process to, to prioritize where to put sidewalks. Um, which is super important because I think um, we heard that it, there's at least $84 million worth of, of um, needs. Um, there's, there's that many, miss that's just to fill in where there's missing sidewalks. And um, it's something like 80 to 100 years at our current funding rate to, to complete the sidewalk network. Um, so hopefully we can ratchet that up a little bit, but at the same time, you know, we have to be really, really careful about where we put the sidewalks in and make sure that they're the, you know, in the place that need the places that need them the most. Um, so that was a that was a pretty cool planning process, and and I think is going to wrap up this like in maybe August or September. Um, and then uh, had a really interesting presentation as well on the Rattlesnake Dam uh, uh, removal c potential. Um, that's a partnership between the um, Missoula Water and Trout Unlimited. Um, there's an int there's a there's a dam um, on Rattlesnake Creek that um, hasn't been used for water supply since I think 1983, um, and um, there's an effort to study what what to do with that dam. Um, Trout Unlimited has provided some funding to to help complete the study. Um, and so the potential is to possibly remove the dam and do some stream restoration and save, um, you know, save the ongoing maintenance costs and um, restore the, the stream to a more natural condition. Um, so staff, Dennis Bowman um, from the water, uh, Missoula Water and um, Rob uh, Roberts from Trout Unlimited came in and um, gave us an update on the public comment to date on that. Um, and again, I think that, pr that study process will wrap up this summer. Um, and then, boy, not a ton of other stuff. Um, this last week, the council approved issuing um, a bond uh, to pay for the 
the improvements at the police department evidence facility on Catlin. Um, that's uh, kind of across the street from West Side Lanes on Catlin, um, as well as the um, some cost overruns at the art park, um, which was kind of an unfortunate uh, turn of events, but um, uh, got shored up in this in this bond that was issued, and. That's kind of, those are the high points. I'd be happy to take any questions, though. Any questions? Yes. Yeah, Dennis Smooth, um, Grand Creek. Um, on that, I saw a report on that, removing that dam, and the cost was $2 million. What they, so is the city going to be paying for that? I, no, I, I think it would be a blended. Um, so right now, there's, I, I think there's about fifteen to $30,000 a year that, that the water system pays to maintain the existing infrastructure up there. So I think that the idea would be that they could use, use some of that money that would be maintained and then a lot of private money. Um, I know Trout Unlimited would be, would be raising a lot of private money, um, also trying to seek out other grants. Um, and so I don't, my impression is that it, wouldn't, it would not be a city funded project other than sort of cost savings for not maintaining the infrastructure. Yeah, I'd, I'd hate to see the water rates in the city. The water company needs so much as it is. So, yeah, absolutely. Another interesting consideration is that there's um, the city has water rights on Rattlesnake Creek that are actually in excess of the water that is in Rattlesnake Creek, um, and so um, being able to maintain those, um, you know, for for possible future need is going to be really important too. So. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. I use Russell Street quite a bit, and I'm very impressed by how it's going. I mean, I don't know. I use it to get to the food bank and even across the bridge. And the signage is so wonderful in the way they've closed down the streets. And you could still go to Pink Grizzly Nursery. Mm -hmm. I'm impressed by it. I'm really glad to hear that. I'll, I'll pass it along. I've been really happy with the, the PR work that um, Big Sky Public Relations has done. has been really great, I think. And mm -hmm. You should turn it about <laughs> <laughs> Jane. So they haven't put a, a traffic light there? Is it at, no, a temporary one, no? Oh, boy. Jane, I can, I can talk to that a little bit. We, we were asking about putting in a traffic light at Wyoming, a, a temporary one, and I guess that they, they, have, to, they have to rent them by the hour. Um, from, the state doesn't own any of them, and so they have to rent them from the, from the contractor. And it was going to be over, this is, this is crazy to me, but it was going to be over a million dollars to do a temporary traffic light for the whole project. So what they're going to do is bring them in, you know, like if they need it for a week or something, they'll bring it in, um, but they're not going to do it for the long term because it was just a stupid amount of money to do it. Well, I, I know they used the traffic light when they were rebuilding the uh, Madison Street Bridge. So they, did they pay that kind of money to rent that light? I don't believe it was in that one because the, they had structured the contract differently. Um, I don't know the answer to that, actually. Yeah, yeah. But, the state might, might do well to invest in a few of those yeah. lights. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rent, them, rent them out. <laughs> okay, any other questions? Seeing none, I will be making a report to City Council, but I don't think it's going to be next Monday. Uh, when will, what date will? June the 4th. June the 4th. And of course, I'll be reporting on the presentations. I will be reporting on the very controversial reallocated funds request from Farview's Paddy Canyon. I will report on that at length. <laughs> and uh, is there anything else that you would like me to report on? I would suggest that uh, any of the things that you we see as important that were mentioned tonight that have come up in the various neighborhood council meetings, like I think you're, you just, sort of being aware for council of the, um, shoot, I can't even remember what, the development that you're going to have to, yeah, the project, town home yeah. one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Anything else? You could mention the day of service with the United Way, and we're partnering also with the National Wildlife Federation for uh, neighborhood cleanup. It's it's still in it's still in the um, planning stages, but that'll be nice. June twenty second. Can I say one more thing um, about Garden City compost? They gave us 
I belong to this group called MELT, um, Montana Elders for a Livable Tomorrow, and they gave us a free day, and and uh, they took all the the anything that would be in the it was fire escape anything that would be uh, flammable in your around your home you could bring in, and they they had an overwhelming uh, lineup of people, and I went too. It, it's amazing what you find around your house that you don't think is there that could be flammable. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to thank them for doing okay. that. Okay, thank you. Jane. I, since we have time, I have something else I forgot to mention. We did Traffic Circle Volunteer Appreciation, and Jason from Garden City Compost was there. Parks and Rec was there, National Wildlife Federation, and also Missoula County Extension. And we had a nice turnout. We had uh, some um, pulled pork barbecue and free plant, not free plants, well, we'll have to pay for them from the budget, but um, the Parks Department provided some plants. And it was just a lovely day. The weather was so nice, and uh, everybody is just so excited to be out and working on their traffic circles. It's so nice to see them turning around and becoming beautiful. There's lots of people working on them. And Chris Boza gave a nice lecture, I thought, too, about how to plant trees properly. Yeah. Okay. Seeing no other comments, I will declare this meeting adjourned about 45 minutes ahead of schedule. And don't forget uh, Jane's birthday on June 12th. I suggest everyone bring her a nice fruit basket. Thank you very much. Go out and enjoy the evening. Yeah. Well, I, th I think we still planned it the right way.